Happy Tuesday, brethren. Happy Tuesday. I had to uh, turn off the air, air condition so that there's no background noise. So um, I just want to thank God for bringing us together on another Tuesday to study His Word. You see we have several people on. I just want to welcome each and every one of you personally to this study. And I pray that as I pray that you will pray for me and that we'll pray for each other. That we may uh, be able to receive what God has for us tonight. The um, topic of tonight's study is entitled Fear Not Little Flock. And it's taken from a message I did many, many, many years ago, but I think it's very relevant even today, and I think that because of the way things are in the world, it's good to, to hear some things that will encourage us, because we know that God is with us. So let us have a word of prayer as we get into this study, and um, I invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to be with us. Let's pray. Dear loving Father, I want to thank you so much for your wonderful love and your tender kindness towards each and every one of us. You have preserved us and brought us to this midweek study. And so, dear Father, we thank you so much for everything that you've done for us and how you continue to guide us. You continue to put a desire in our hearts to hear your word and to just be around those that love your word and love your truth. And so, dear God, we just, we really cherish moments like these where we can come together and to study your word and so dear God as we open up your word we invite your presence to be with us we pray that your Holy Spirit will take charge of this study of my lips and my heart my mind each and every one of us that we may be able to receive from your throne a message tonight something that will carry us through the remainder of the week even and so, dear God, as we get closer and closer to your appearing, may we continue to keep our eyes fixed upon you and our hearts full with strength and joy and peace from above. And so, dear Father, this is why we come before you. We pray that your angels will surround us and we pray that every distraction will be kept away and that we'll be able to focus. And as your word comes into our hearts, that it may have a sanctifying influence in our character development. We thank you and we praise you for we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. So again, welcome for to, to for those of you who might have just joined. We're looking at a topic entitled Fear Not Little Flock. That's a beautiful uh, uh, thought, you know, that God is telling us to fear not, you know. God is encouraging us, saying, you have nothing to fear, because you are my little flock. You know, God calls us his little flock, you know, when you think about that. It's like an endearing term that God has for each and every one of us. And think about it, it's a flock. And I was talking about sheep, um, you know, this past Sabbath, and how they defend themselves is they come together. And God desires for all of us to come together as a flock, you know. And that's where strength lies. You know, this is why when you go out door to door, you go out ministering, usually you go no, no, no less than two people at a time, right? You stick together and you have, you, you, there's more strength in numbers. And so God is, a, is desiring all of us to come together in a oneness of mind, a oneness of heart. And that's where the strength lies. Um, we don't have to be physically together all the time, but just to know that, God has a remnant people on earth that will not deviate, that will not compromise, that will remain true, and that will uh, seek to vindicate His name by whatever means necessary and whatever it costs. And so if we find ourselves on, you know, uh, in a place where we think we're all alone and we're standing for Jesus Christ and seems like oh, everything that's bad is, is happening to us we're not the first ones we won't be the last ones and and God has many people out there that are standing for him so we're not alone fear not little flock 
Luke chapter 12 verse 32 says that very thing. Fear not little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is what gives God pleasure. His pleasure is to give you the kingdom. You see, he didn't create, he didn't create humanity or creatures for us to serve him. He, he created creatures to give us the kingdom. Think about that. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a beautiful thought to think about. You know, this is what God created us for. To give, to share with us, to love us, you know, to bless us. That's a beautiful, beautiful God that we have. You know, and we're, we're living in some ominous times, and that's true. I mean, everybody knows it. And, you know, we keep hearing about it over and over, but it's because, you know, that's the times we're living in. And it's, you know, that's just the way it is. The Bible states that there, there, there's going to be a time when men's hearts will fail them for fear. For looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Because why? Because the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Doesn't mean that the angels and God is going to be shaken. It means it means that the, the powers of, 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 of the sky, of nature, that's what it means. It's not talking about the heavens where God is in, 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 a, in a literal sense. It's talking about the, the, the heaven where we are. You know, we, we're living in the first realm of heaven, the first layer of heaven which is our atmosphere from here to space. But even in, in our own uh, space, there'll probably all, be all kind of uh, uh, things shaken. You know, So Luke 21, 26 tells us these things. You know, This is like a prophecy of what's coming. And men's hearts will fail them for fear because of these things that are happening on the earth and because things are being shaken you know, left and right. And this could be mountains. Look what's happening right now in, in the Spanish islands off of Africa. Uh, the, the, the earthquakes, you know, there's uh, uh, there's uh, volcanoes erupting. There's all kind of, and these people are shaken, and they're probably full of fear right now. We should be praying for them, by the way. We should be praying for these people over there in these islands. But they're not the only ones. It's all over the earth. Things are happening, and so people are being shaken right now because the earth is being shaken, it, almost, and in in a literal literal sense. In many places. And you know, you often think, can somebody really die from fear? You know, is that really possible? Well, some of the major news networks seem to think so. Here's an article that I found from uh, BBC uh, News Network, <clears throat> and it was entitled, Fear Can Kill. Notice what it says it says, Scientists are launching a study to try to predict which people are in danger of dying from fright. According to New Scientist magazine, researchers are now convinced that there is some truth in the old saying, I was scared to death. Compelling evidence for the theory that fear can kill was provided by a study of deaths following the 1994 Los Angeles earthquake. Think about that. Dr. Robert Cloner, a cardiologist at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles, reviewed the records of the Los Angeles County Coroner's Depart uh, Department for the week before the earthquake took place, the day of the earthquake, and corresponding control periods in 1991, 92, and 93. His team found that on the day of the quake, the coroner recorded five times more sudden cardiac deaths than would ordinarily be expected. This was nothing to do with people physically exerting themselves as they dug themselves out of the rubble. Dr. Cloner said the typical story was that a patient clutched his chest, described chest pain, and dropped over dead. In some cases, the body's own fight or flight response to danger appears to backfire and stop the heart completely. It may also trigger fatal heart attacks. A similar phenomenon occurred when the Iraqis launched missile strikes on Israel during the Gulf War in 1991. During the early hours of January 18th, when the first attack occurred, 147 deaths were recorded. Most of these deaths were from heart attacks, 
and the increased mortality was limited to the first day of missiles. People were scared to death, literally. A healthy person may become so terrified that the brain triggers the release of a mix of chemicals so potent that it induces a massive influx of calcium into the heart cells. The release of hormones causes arteries to clamp down, for example, and platelets start to aggregate in readiness for clotting. Blood rushing through narrowed vessels also generates sheer force against cholesterol plaque stuck to blood vessel walls. If a plaque breaks, the, de the debris can cause a clot and block blood flow to the heart muscle. This causes the heart to con contract so fiercely that it never relaxes again. Wow. So according to that news article, you know, fear kills. Fear can kill. People can actually be scared to death. And it's happening all over the world right now. And a lot of them are being, you know, blamed, they're being uh, counted as some other deaths, which we're not going to mention right now. But anyway, inspiration gives us an idea of why many are getting scared to death. And we find the answer in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, paragraph 1. And we're going to read 1 and 2. Inspiration says that we are living in the time of the end. The fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are already falling upon the despisers of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war are potentious. They forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. And I'll tell you, even people who are not religious are seeing these things. And they're, they're, they're discerning the signs of the times. Even people who are not religious. But, uh, verse 2. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world, and the final movements will be rapid ones. And brothers and sisters, I believe that we're in the middle of that. Great changes have already been seen in our world, and they're just going to continue to shift in the paradigm of evil. Also, verse 3, we're going to read of Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11. It says, the condition of things in the world shows that troublous times are right upon us. The daily papers are full of indications of a terrible conflict in the near future. Bold robberies are a frequent occurrence. Strikes are common. Thefts, murders are committed on every hand. Men possessed of demons are taking the lives of men, women, and little children. We see this happening right now in Afghanistan. Men have become infatuated with vice. And every species of evil prevails. And this is absolutely true. You know, they have all kind of wickedness happen. Demonic uh, uh, gatherings taking place in the middle of deserts in America. Uh, there's one called the Burning Man that takes place in Nevada. Uh, right in the middle of the salt flats. It's, it's satanic. Thousands of people go there to, to, to worship the unknown god what they would say uh, but satanic things are happening I'm going to ask you if you can please keep your mics on mute while we are doing this study thank you and so this is absolutely being fulfilled right now matter of fact we're going to read one more verse of testimony volume 9 page 11 paragraph 4, uh, four. It says, the enemy has succeeded in perverting justice and in filling men's hearts with the desire for selfish gain. Justice stands afar off, for truth is fallen in the streets and equity cannot enter. It's quoting Isaiah 59, 14. We absolutely see this in the courts of, 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 of justice, of the law. 
Supreme Courts, we see that it's so corrupt today uh, that anything can go and they legalize it. We see that happening here in America. All kind of evil is being legalized. And, 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 and uh, injustices are not being persecuted because they're being committed by maybe some people who, uh, who are high up in, in government in different places. I mean, just the other day, we heard about one of the generals of the army here, uh, supposedly, was uh, saying he was going to tell an enemy nation if we would ever uh, plan to invade them or to, to, to strike them. You know, but we don't see any, any, uh, any repercussions towards this guy. No, 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 there's no punishment for that. So justice stands afar off, and that's absolutely true today. In the great cities, there are multitudes living in poverty and wretchedness, well nigh destitute of food, shelter, and clothing. We see this all over in different parts of the world. While in the same cities are those who have more than heart could wish, who live luxuriously, spending their money on richly furnished houses, on personal adornment, or even worse still, upon the gratification of sensual appetites upon liquor, tobacco, and other things that destroy the powers of the brain, unbalance the mind, and debase the soul. The cries of starving humanity are coming up before God. While by every species of oppression and extortion, men are piling up colossal fortunes. Absolutely true. We see that happening today. Matter of fact, we see that Revelation 18.23 describing the merchant men of the earth are in cahoots with Satan and with the beast system to try to uh, deceive the masses by way of pharmaceuticals. It's happening right now all across the globe. It, it, there's no justice what's happening in this world right now. So, the question we need to ask ourselves, do we believe, do we really believe that we're in the last final moments of Earth's history? Because the world is noticing that something very serious is about to take place. They're getting ready. A news article I read uh, a while back stated that a, a, a Republican congresswoman, which I'm not going to name right now, uh, believed that we were, were living in the end times. And she claims to have proof. I'm going to quote something that she, she said. And she said this, This happened as of, as a, and as of today, the United States is willing, this, this, is, this is an article from, this is about, Eight years old, and listen how how uh, it sounds like if it, if if it applies today. You know, it's like it's amazing that this was happening eight years ago, and it's happening today. Notice what she said: This happened, and as of today, the United States is willing, knowingly, intentionally, sending arms to terrorists. <laughs> Interesting. This was happening eight years ago. We just left ninety billion dollars worth of. Uh, armory for terrorists over there in Afghanistan. So it, it, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. This was happening from years ago and notice how this seems like it's a, it's a, it's a headline for the other week, but this was a headline for, from eight years ago. And this congresswoman was, was blowing the whistle here saying that the United States is willing, knowingly, intentionally sending arms to terrorists. Now, what this says to me, she said, she says, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. As I look at the end time scripture, this says to me that the leaf is on the fig tree. And we are to understand the signs of the times, which is your ministry. We are to understand where we are in God's end time history. This is from a congresswoman. Rather than seeing this as a negative, we need to rejoice. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, his day is at hand, she said. When we see up in, uh, when we see up is down and right is called wrong, when this is happening, we were told this, that these days would be as the days of Noah, end quote. Wow. Think about that. This was from a congresswoman eight years ago. But yet it sounds like it was for today, even more pertinent. For today than probably eight years ago for sure wikipedia tells us that in 1947 
scientists that have been studying the impending destruction of the world, they set up a meter called the Doomsday Clock. And I'm not going to go through all of the things that I had written eight years ago because I just got an update for this presentation. And so I got an update of 2021. And you know what they did? Uh, in 2021, this, this year, they updated the Doomsday Clock. And they set the Doomsday Clock at 100 seconds to midnight. You may ask, what is the Doomsday Clock? Well, the Doomsday Clock is a symbolic clock face representing an ominous oscillating countdown maintained since 1947 by the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists at the University of Chicago. The closer they set the clock to midnight, the closer the Science and Security Board believes the world to be to, uh, on, on, a, on a way to a global disaster. That's, well, that's, a, what, that's what a doomsday clock is. And so the most recent setting was at 100 seconds to midnight. And the article says the clo this is the closest it has ever been because the existential risks confronting humanity today call for quick and comprehensive action across the 21st century's complex threat spec spec uh, spectrum. So these scientists believe that we're closer to a global disaster than ever in the history of the world. 100 seconds, that's one minute and a half. Well, uh, it's about one minute and 40 seconds, right? A little over one minute and a half to midnight. Closest it's ever been. So do they think that uh, the Earth is getting closer to the end? Uh, yes, they do. And these are not even people that are necessarily Christians. These are scientists. Revelation 3.17 says, The children of this world know that something stupendous is about to happen, but God's professed children say, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. Revelation 3.17 This is what many of those who profess to be God's children are saying today. We don't have a need of nothing. We're rich. We're increased with goods. Can it be that the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light, according to Luke 16.8? Because many of them are preparing. I mean, they're trying to prepare, in, you know, of course, in bunkers and all these other things. But we should be prepared in Christ so that we have no fear. And we come together as one fold or one flock. In what? How do we become one? We become one in what? In love, in purpose, right? Come together in character. We should have that same character of Christ. Doesn't mean that we're all the same like cookie cutter or robots. No, it means that we are distinct. We have our own personalities, but our personalities are 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 molded after the pattern of Christ. That's where we need to be. And that's where God's people will be when they become that one fold. So far we've learned that the world is watching. National Geographic has identified a class of people that uh, uh, as doomsday preppers even. Um, here's a quote. Otherwise ordinary Americans who are preparing for the end of the world as we know it. Unique in their beliefs, motivations, and strategies. Preppers will go to whatever lengths they can to make sure they are prepared for any of life's uncertainties. So there's doomsday preppers preparing. But are we preparing? That's the question. Because it is going to be us that usher in the final movements. It is when God's people are prepared that the end will come. It's going to be sweet and sour at the same time. Fox News reports... Residents of the small city, once known uh, for its farming and mining, can begin applying for permits to build their subterranean housing. This was eight years ago, remember. This study's eight years old. So back then they were, they were preparing. They were getting permits to build subterranean housing after the city council had passed uh, uh, an ordinance allowing the, the, these type of uh, construction. 
And Americans have been building underground bunkers for decades. That was from almost 10 years ago. So you could say for about 30 years now, probably people have been building these underground facilities to prepare for what they see coming as the end of the world as we know it or major cataclysmic destruction. So the Bible tells us in Revelation 6 verses 14 to 17 it tells us that soon the heavens will depart as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island will be moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man will hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. What are these? The doomsday preppers. And they will say to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? I guess in that day, all the doomsday preppers are going to know that they're uh, trying to hide from the Lamb. You know, the Bible does say when Jesus comes, every eye will see Him. So everybody will know that they had prepared these bunkers and all these things because they didn't want anything to do with the Lamb. They might not be aware of it right now, consciously, but there will be a time when every single doomsday prepper will know, if they were not in Christ, that they have been fighting against all of heaven. Yes. The question is, we have to ask ourselves, will we be among them? If we allow fear to grab a hold of us, then it's possible that we will be in the same boat with them. Are we taking the name of the Lord and glorifying it? Or are we taking the, Lord, uh, the name of the Lord and using it in vain? Because the Bible tells us in Exodus 27, the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. If we allow fear, brothers and sisters consume us we are not allowing faith to preserve us because without faith it is impossible to please God anything that is not a faith is sin by our lifestyles it tells if we're changing into the glory of God or if we're changing the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Going to Romans 1.23. Our life will demonstrate either one. Are we magnifying the truth of God? Or are we changing the truth of God into a lie? And worshipping and serving the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Romans 1.25 Do we like to retain God in our mind? Or are we filling it with mindless fluff every day? Do we not like to retain God in our knowledge? Has God given us over to a reprobate mind? To do those things which are not convenient according to Romans 1.28? Hopefully not. But we need to examine ourselves today. We don't want to be found filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, 
not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them these things? Romans 1, 29 to 32. We don't want to be found in any of those categories. You see, you know, every time a person watches, even just watches sin, like, or listens to sin, like on TV or on, on the radio, you know, that individual is taking pleasure in them that do those things that are listed in, in Romans there, Romans 1, 29 to 32. And by watching and listening to those things, we are recorded as doing the same things which we are beholding. And that is something to fear. If we're living in that type of mindset and lifestyle, that's something we need to fear because that will lead us into destruction. Filling our minds with sin will mold our minds and keep them sealed in sin. Eventually, we would be sealed in sin. The Bible tells us that now is the time to do what? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine those that we minister to. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Lord have mercy. 2 Timothy 4 verses 2 to 4. There's still some time to reach people. But if we're spending our free time on all these other things that are filling our minds with sin it's going to be very hard to give other people the truth about the righteousness of Christ when our minds always being uh, marinating in unrighteousness you can't give somebody something that you don't have you have to have the word and, 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 and have Jesus Christ to be able to give him to others So the question is, should the people of the world be the ones that are awake? Or should we also know the times that we're living in? Romans 13, 11, 14 says, Knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. There's no more time to sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Amen? Praise the Lord. You see, God is sending this message of warning to, for, for a good reason, to protect us. God is in the job again of protecting and blessing, nurturing, you know, serving. He serves us, you know. He wants to protect us. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and all these things in diverse ma in places. Going to Matthew 24, 7. God is calling us to be enlisted in the flock of Christ so that we won't have any fear. Fear is what causes people to lie cheat, steal, kill. I mean, every sin in, in, the, in the book, in, in the, it, it, it's, I, I believe fear is a major motivating a influence. Major motivating. I'm going to ask you guys to try to keep your mics on mute. Thank you. All right. So we need to be enlisted in the flock of Christ. But first, we must know who the flock are. Right? Who is this little flock? Well, Isaiah 40, verses 9 to 11 says, O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountains, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength and lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand. 
and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Wow. God's little flock are those that are fed and led by the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the ones that lift up their voice with strength. They're not afraid. They have no fear. They say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Wow. This is God's flock. And to say, Behold your God, means you must get a, have a good understanding of God's character. How can you uh, be able to share God, you know, so people can behold Him in His true sense if we don't really even know it ourselves. Christ's Object Lessons, page 415, paragraph 5, also tells us who the little flock are. It says here, Those who wait for the bridegroom's, wait coming. For the bridegroom's coming. I keep hearing some I background hearing noise, Frederick. Some Somebody keeps unmuting themselves. Somebody keeps unmuting themselves. I think Alvin, Alvin, you got to keep your mic on mute, all right, brother? That was, I think that was yours twice. All right, thank you. All right. Christ Object Lessons, page 415, paragraph 5. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God. And we know the rest. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of God's character of love. Praise the Lord. So this is God's little flock. This is God's end time flock. They are led and fed by Jesus Christ himself. And in verse 1 of four, uh, four, uh, chapter 416 of Christ's Object Lessons, it says, The light of the Son of Righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth and deeds of holiness. This is what God's little flock will be about. They won't be about wasting their time and filling their minds with violence. Because that will bring fear. Anything that is sinful will bring fear to the mind, to the heart. That's right. Violence will bring fear. The little flock of believers, the remnant which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, according to Revelation 12, 17, they hear and believe the following words of Jesus Christ, which I'm going to read, found, from, found in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 12, and verses 22 to 40. Notice what it says. It says, Take no thought for your life. Wow. Take no thought for your life, or what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what you should put on, the life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, they neither have storehouse nor barn, but God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you which with uh, taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, Neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye need these things. You have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. 
For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Notice it says here, even the good man of the house, he prepares for the thief. He's always on watch to make sure you know that the thief doesn't come and break into his house. Well, we have to be just as diligent in our watching for the Lord's coming. You see, God has been shedding precious light to His children in, the, in these last days. The Bible states that if He shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch, and we know that uh, we have a few more years in the, in, in the, in the second watch here, uh, but we're not going to get into those studies right now. But blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when He cometh, shall find watching. So the question, are we watching, brethren, or are we living in fear? Because fear will cause us to be distracted. Is our conscience causing us many sleepless nights or all the worries and cares of this world? Are they causing us to, to sleep restless at night? If we are fearful, we need an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ today. Maybe we are letting sin to consume us slowly. Jesus wants to save us from our sins today, not in them, like many people teach. Jesus didn't come to save us in our sins, but from our sins. He wants to clear out our record so that we can be free today. Only then will we experience true peace and rest that He wants to so eagerly grant to us. Now let us examine the meaning of watching. Proverbs 8.34 says, Blessed is the man that hears me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. The Word of God tells us that we are blessed if we hear God, watching daily at His gates, waiting at the posts of His doors. So let's examine something. Let's look at an example in the Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 4. Uh, I think it's verse 10 to 18, I believe. It says here, And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. That's a lot. Imagine how many, that's a lot of people dead in one night. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh and th the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching. Notice it says, Eli was upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that Eli fell from off the seat backwards by the side of the gate and his neck break and he died for he was an old man and heavy and he had judged Israel 40 years now what did 
Proverbs 8.34 says, said, what did it say? Blessed is the man that heareth me, watches daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. Well, here we just read of an example where there was war and strife in the camp. It seemed as if it was going to be the end of all things for the nation of Israel. They were sorely smitten and the survivors fled. The ark representing God's presence was taken. Their protection was gone. All seemed to be at an end. But where was Eli? Eli was apparently sitting upon a seat by the wayside, watching by the side of the gate. Isn't that what the Bible says we should be doing? Yeah, but question. Is this the type of watching that the Bible admonishes us to do? The, was Eli the priest really watching the way the Bible says that we should watch? Well, he was watching, yes. But, was, but, but he was not watching in a spiritual sense. He was watching in the physical sense, like a, uh, like a uh, security guard, right? He was watching like a security guard. But that's not what the Bible is telling us to do. Eli was not watching with the spiritual eye. He was watching with the physical eye, by a literal gate, sitting by a, uh, you know. <laughs> but he, he did not, he was not watching the way God intended him to watch. You see, the epitaph of Eli was sadly recorded in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 14. And this is what it says. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. That's not, that doesn't sound too good for a, a judge of Israel. That was a, 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 a Eli ended his life on a bad note, we can say, according to 1 Samuel 3.14. Now, Christ asked his disciples to watch, but in a different sense. Matthew chapter 26, verses 40-41, he came to the disciples and find them sleeping and said unto Peter, What could ye not, you, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray? And ye enter not into temptation? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So what was this type of watching that God was really uh, uh, asking of his disciples? Christ was admonishing his disciples to stay awake with him in prayer. Watching is to stay awake in the spiritual sense. Not be slow to sleep in an indolent type of Christianity. And God has given us tools to help keep us awake, by the way. Um, Christian Education, page 105, paragraph 2 says, The Bible is the book of books and is the most deserving of the closest study and attention. It gives not only the history of the creation of this world, but a description of the world to come. It contains instruction concerning the wonders of the universe. And it reveals to our understanding the author of the heavens and the earth. It unfolds a simple and complete system of theology and philosophy. Those who are close students of the Word of God and who obey its instructions and love its plain truths will improve in mind and manners. It is an endowment of God that should awaken in every heart the most sincere gratitude for it is the revelation of God to man praise the Lord also reading from Christian education page 106 paragraph 1 says if the truths of the Bible are woven into practical life they will bring the mind up from its earthliness and debasement those who are conversant with the scriptures will be found to be men and women who exert an, an elevating influence. In searching for the heaven-revealed truths, the Spirit of God is brought into close connection with the sincere searcher of the Scriptures. An understanding of the real, revealed will of God enlarges the mind, expands, elevates, and endows it with new vigor 
by bringing its faculties in contact with stupendous truths. Praise the Lord. What was Eli doing? He was just sitting there waiting and watching like, a, like an armed guard. But we need to be watching in prayer as Jesus instructed his disciples. Today we must be studying the word deeply, remaining in an attitude of prayer. And the disciples, you know, eventually they were led to do that. And the uh, uh, Spirit of Prophecy in, 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 the, in Acts, also it's quoting Acts 4.31 says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. Notice what the power that came upon the disciples once they realized what, what watching in a spiritual sense really meant. When they really implemented the true sense of watching. Notice here, Acts 4.31. When they had prayed in the true sense of the word with a sincere heart, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Didn't we read earlier that the people of the world will be their, their hearts will fail them for fear of what's coming upon the earth and also uh, because the heavens will be shaken. Notice here that where they were, the place where they were praying began to shake. You see, there's, 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 a, there's a power that also comes upon God's people which is described as a shaking. They've been shaken. The place was shaken where they were assembled together because they were filled with the Holy Ghost. You see... When we're filled with the Holy Ghost, things are going to get shook up. Believe me. This world is going to get so shook up that all hell is going to break loose. God's people have to come to that place of prayer, of watching, that is so deep and so uh, solemn that the whole earth will be shaken. Yes. Inspiration also goes on to say, and in quoting Zechariah 10, 1, it says, The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the former rain, and glorious was the result. But the latter rain, which was promised for us in our time, will be still more abundant. So imagine if the little place where they were at was shaken. Imagine when the, former, when the latter rain comes to us. The whole earth is going to be shaken. And it doesn't mean in a, in a literal sense, but in a spiritual sense. Although there will be some physical shaking as well. It says, but the latter rain will be more, st still more abundant. What is the promise to those living in the last days, in these last days? Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Wow. Zechariah 9, verse 12. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Wow, amazing. I really love Zechariah 9, 12. Turn ye, turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Praise God. We have to claim these promises, brethren, and receive them by faith. Christ declares that the divine influence of the Spirit was to be with His followers unto the end. But by some, this promise is not appreciated as it should be. Its fulfillment is not realized as it might be. Learning Talents, eloquence, every natural or acquired endowment may be possessed, but without the presence of the Spirit of God, no heart will be touched, no sinner won to Christ. When His disciples are connected with Christ, when the gifts of the Spirit are theirs, even the poorest and most ignorant of them will have a power that will tell upon hearts. God makes them the channel for the outworking of the highest influence in the universe. Praise the Lord. As the divine endowment, the power of the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples, 
so it will today be given to all who seek who seek it aright this power alone is able to make us wise unto salvation and to fit us for the courts above Christ wants to give us a blessing that will make us holy brothers and sisters John 5 15 11 says these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full you see joy in the Holy Spirit is health giving life giving in giving us his spirit God gives us himself a fountain of divine influences to give health and life to the world he gives so that we can reciprocate it so we can give it to the world in steps to Christ page 71 paragraph 2 says when the mind dwells upon self it is turned away from Christ the source of strength and life hence it is Satan's constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and communion of the soul with Christ the pleasures of the world life's cares and perplexities and sorrows the faults of others or your own faults and imperfections to any or all of these he will seek to divert the mind do not be misled by his devices brothers and sisters many who are really conscientious and who desire to live for God he too often leads to dwell upon their own faults and weaknesses and thus by separating them from Christ he hopes to gain the victory we should not make self the center and indulge anxiety and fear as to whether we shall be saved Jesus died for all of our sins doesn't mean we're gonna be exactly perfect right away we're gonna make mistakes as we go down the road but you know what God has promised that he has covered us with his blood if you see the only sin that will cause a person to be lost is the rejection of the life giver is the rejection of the substitute Jesus Christ so if we really accept Jesus Christ we're going to be fighting the good fight of faith we're going to be struggling with self that's what we will be doing it doesn't mean you're lost because you're struggling with self it means you haven't been perfected yet but as long as you have accepted Jesus Christ in your heart and you're sincerely fighting the good fight of faith trying to overcome but with cooperating with God and the kingdom of heaven then even if you die imperfect you're covered and you're looked upon as perfect because of righteousness by faith the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ so Satan wants to cause us to dwell upon our faults and weaknesses and thus by separating us from Christ he hopes to gain the victory we shall not make self the center and indulge anxiety and fear as to whether we shall be saved all this turns the soul away from the source of our strength commit the keeping of your soul to God and trust in him talk and think of Christ let self be lost in him put away all doubt dismiss your fears say with the Apostle Paul I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me Galatians 2:20. rest in God he he is able to keep that which you have committed to him if you will leave yourselves in his hands he will bring you off more than conqueror through him that has loved you praise God see brethren the battle is raging absolutely but we're told fear not little flock John 16 33 in the world you shall have tribulation but be of good cheer why I have overcome the world for you our high calling page 311 paragraph 2 says the world's Redeemer represents or presents to his followers the plan of the battle in which they are called to engage and he bids them count the cost he assures them that angels who excel in strength shall be in his army and will enable those who trust in him to fight valiantly this doesn't mean fight physically to fight valiantly means to fight against the flesh against sin it's a spiritual war it's not a physical war this is why Jesus told Peter we don't use our, our the weapons of our our kingdom are not carnal we, we don't use swords and bats and chains and guns 
We use the word, truth, love. These are the weapons. But he says, count the cost. But he assures us that the angels will be with us to fight with us valiantly. One shall chase a thousand, we're told. And two, put ten thousand to flight. But not through their own strength, but through the power of omnipotence. The captain of the Lord's host is with us, brethren, taking the command of the armies and leading all of us onto victory. A few more quotations and we're going to close. Our High Calling 311, paragraph 3 says, Because of their human frailty, because of their sinfulness, they may fear and tremble as they view the vast host of the powers of darkness. And this is going to happen to many people because we're going to be encamped around with the host of the powers of darkness. But they may rejoice, we're told, we may rejoice as we look upon the angels of God ready to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. We may rejoice as we realize that the captain of the Lord's host will lead us forward in every conflict against natural and supernatural foes. Our leader is a conqueror. And we're told, advance to victory. Brethren, how precious are these assurances that we shall never be left to take one step in our own finite strength. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13.5 We are fighting in the presence of invisible hosts. Unseen intelligences survey the whole array of, of evil and help is at hand. We shall not only be provided with that which is necessary, but shall be placed upon vantage ground. To every Christian comes the word that was addressed to Peter. Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith faileth not. Luke 22, 31. Thank God, brothers and sisters, that we are not left alone. This is our safety. Satan can never touch with eternal disaster one whom Christ has prepared for temptation by his precious previous intercession. For grace is provided in Christ for every soul and a way of escape has been made so that no one need fall under the power of the enemy. You see, Jesus is the good shepherd. His followers are the sheep of his pasture. As we said, Sabbath past. A shepherd is always with his flock to defend them to keep them from the wolves, to hunt up the lost sheep and carry them back to the fold, to lead them beside green pastures and beside living waters. Fear not, little flock, for there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love, brethren. That is a sign that we need to receive Jesus Christ. If we're living in fear, we need to accept, open the door of the heart and, and let Jesus Christ in today and all of that fear will be gone. For God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7 And I quoted a minute ago, 1 John 4 verse 18. So look up, lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. Luke 21, 28. Brethren, I pray that this study tonight would have lifted up our souls in the sense that we have the assurance that no matter what comes our way, if we have Christ, we have all the armies of heaven on our side. If we're living in fear and in torment, then God invites us today, surrender your hearts. Let me into your heart. That's what Jesus Christ is saying today. So brethren, my prayer is that every single person within the hearing of my voice today has been encouraged to go forward in this battle. Not to uh, look at our shortcomings, but if we truly have accepted Jesus Christ, then we are safe in Him. Let us just keep fighting the good fight, fight of faith. Let us keep running the race and help others that are weaker. Let's let's be a help because if, if we have Christ in us, then that's what's we're going to be motivated to help others to bring to, to, to bring those tender sheep into the fold because 
in the fold, there's safety. In Christ, following the shepherd, there's safety. There's no fear in that, but perfect peace because we have found the perfect love. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for speaking to our hearts today. We thank you for Jesus Christ, who has who is a conqueror. He's already crushed the head of the serpent. And Lord, we just pray that we can help to vindicate his name to the world. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be strong. That all fear will be removed from our hearts as we recognize that we are on the winning side. The battle has already been won in reality. And Lord, you know all of our needs. You know all of our cares. We don't have to worry about nothing. All we have to do is trust you. Seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And we have guaranteed that everything would be for our good. And every good and perfect gift would be given to us. For Lord, you especially hold us in the bosom, in your bosom, Lord. You, you keep us protected under the shadow of your wings. No matter what it looks like out here. It's all an illusion. In the sense that nothing can touch us. Only as you filter it and allow it for some good. And so dear Father, we thank you so much for speaking to us. Be with everyone within the hearing my voice. I pray Lord if anybody's out there that may be fearing and having troubles with uh, anxiety and all these things. Lord, I pray that you would touch their hearts. And help them to recognize that there's a way out. And that way is to open the door to Jesus Christ. Because in Him there is perfect peace and joy. And so dear Father we thank you. And we praise your holy name. May you continue to be with us as we go through the remainder of this week. And the remainder of our lives. Continue to keep us near to you. And give us that boldness. But also give us that meekness. So that we can represent you aright. And bless us as we continue to go forward. For we ask this in Jesus name. With thanksgiving. 